everybody. My name is Allison Bender and I work at UW-Madison at the Wisconsin Energy Institute where we have scientists and engineers studying all types of different renewable energies. I'm really excited to be with you today. I'm going to show you how to do an experiment just like our biofuels researchers are working on. So even though we're all stuck at home keeping people safe, we're still reliant on planes and chips and big trucks moving goods and services to where they need to be. And all of these transportation vehicles are still powered by fuel. What fuel? Well, mostly petroleum or oil that we drill up from deep underneath the ground. We call petroleum oil a fossil fuel because it's made with dead plants and animals from millions of years ago that over those millions of years and heat and pressure have compressed into the oil or coal or gas that we uh, excavate and use today. And we know that that's a problem because we know that when we dig up that old carbon and we burn it, we're releasing that carbon into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change and having lots of negative impacts on people's health. So we've got a puzzle. We need to power our boats and our jet planes and our trucks, but we don't wanna use fossil fuels. We don't want to use carbon that was held and sequestered under the ground and release it into the air. So what can we do? Well, people who are researchers at the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, where I work, say, what about plants? Could we use plants that take in carbon as they grow, as they photosynthesize, and then we use those plants to make the fuel? So it's more of a circle of carbon rather than taking the old buried carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. So today I'm gonna to teach you how to set up an experiment that you can use to see part of the process of making biofuels. But don't worry, you're not gonna do it alone. You're gonna use yeast. Um, this is just normal baker's yeast, active dry yeast that I got at the grocery store. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in jars like the one on the picture here. Yeast is a really incredible microorganism. An organism so small you can't see it without a microscope. It's single-celled and there are many, many different kinds. Today we're just going to use baker's yeast. Yeast has this incredible ability and you might have heard of it before. Um, yeast does fermentation. That's when we give it sugar or we give it glucose. It can metabolize or it can eat, sort of digest that sugar and change it into two things. One of those is ethanol and one of those is carbon dioxide. Ethanol is a type of biofuel that we can use. The researchers are studying other types of fuels too, but today we're going to stick with the simple fermentation process. So what we're going to do today is we're going to think, what food or feedstock can we give the yeast that will allow it to ferment the best. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an experiment. Thinking about variables in our experiment, I've got four with me today, but you can choose um, any number of different things that you want to test. I've got sugar from sugar cane, it's a plant. I've got cornmeal. Cornmeal is the ground up corn kernels of the plant. I've got some dead, some dried leaves from outside, some from grasses and other plants. And lastly, I've got sawdust, so ground up wood. And we're going to see which one of these, when we feed it to the yeast, will work the best. So, before we set up the experiment, one of the most important things that we do in the scientific process is make predictions, make our hypotheses. So I want you, when you have your um, variables, the things you're going to test. Make sure you take some time to think about which one do you think is going to work the best and jot down some notes before you get started. Once you're ready to set up your experiment, you're just going to need two more things besides your yeast and your feedstocks. You're going to need a plastic bag and you're going to need some warm water. What you're going to do with each feedstock is the same process. So we're only changing one thing with each setup. You're going to take a scoop, I've got a teaspoon here, um, a teaspoon of yeast in every bag, then a teaspoon of your feedstock. I'm going to start with the sugar. So I've got a scoop here, adding it to the yeast in my bag. So now I've got yeast and I've got a food. 
The last thing I need is 50 milliliters or about a quarter cup of water. And again, this is the sort of thing where it doesn't exactly matter how much water as long as each one of your um, setups is the same. Once I've got the water in there, I'm going to seal my Ziploc bag shut, making sure to try and eliminate any extra air that's in the bag. I'm going to mix it up, shake it up a little bit, maybe squish it a little bit so all the globs of food are mixed around. And then I'm going to move on to my next one. But another part of science that's really important is keeping careful notes and labeling things. And so, so when I set up the other bags, just so I don't get confused, I'm going to make a sort of placemat or data table where I've listed here my four different feedstocks, and it'll just help me keep track of which one is which. So I'll set my bag with the sugar right over there, and I'm ready to move on to my next one. So now I'm going to do the cornmeal. Again, we have one scoop of the yeast into the bag, one scoop of our feedstock, in this case it's the cornmeal, and then again we're going to add our warm water. This kind of activates the yeast. I do have a thermometer here too, I tested the water. Um, just the hottest your faucet can go is great, otherwise Sometimes we measure and we like it to be around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, I'm adding my quarter cup of water to my bag here. I'm sealing my bag shut and I'm mixing it up. So I'm gonna let you go ahead, find your feedstocks, set them up in your bags Another important thing to remember is we want to do um, a constant. So what would happen if we just put yeast and water and no feedstock in the bag? So we'll add that to the side too so we can compare that. Once you've got your bag set up, take a look at the clock. Let's see, I'm going to jot down what time it is. It's about 10 o'clock, 9.57, so I'll have that. And then as your yeast is fermenting, Every five or ten minutes, take a look back and see what's happening. You could use another piece of paper. I'm going to leave it up to you to design your type of um, data table or your note taking. But something that's really important in science is um, making observations and noticing what happens. Speaking of observations, we set up this experiment with the question, which feedstock will the yeast ferment the best? But what does the best really mean? Well, if you go back to when we talked about fermentation, remember that when the yeast is fermenting, it makes two things. It makes ethanol and it makes carbon dioxide. So you might be able to think to yourself, how am I going to know if it's fermenting in my closed plastic bag? Well, you might see changes. You might see maybe bubbles. Maybe your bag starts filling up with the carbon dioxide. Maybe the color might change, who knows? So take notice of what's going on in your bag and make your observations as um, time goes on. All right, you guys. All right, you guys. It's been about 30 minutes since I set up my experiments. I made myself a little data table. You can set it up however you like, but I put my feedstocks and my constant over here on the left. And every 10 minutes, I made a new column to write down what I was observing and noticing going on in my bags. I'm gonna give you um, some spoilers now. So if you haven't done your experiment yet and you don't wanna see what happens with mine, pause the video and just come back after you've done your um, setup and observations for about 30 minutes. So if we look at my bags, um, I don't know how well you can see this in the video, but it's really clear to me uh, looking at the table that one of my feedstocks really took off. One of them is quite different from the others and from the constant. Uh, and that one is the sugar. You can see the bag 
it, the color is a little whiter. Maybe that's because of um, the color it was to begin with, but you can see there's bubbles all around the edges and the bag has filled up um, with carbon dioxide. So I've got that and I've got my visual observations, but because I like to take data and to keep track of things, what I'm gonna do also is use a ruler and I'm gonna measure each one of the heights of the bags. So I'm gonna use the centimeter side of the ruler. I'm gonna hold it up to my bag. Sometimes it can be helpful to set a piece of paper flat to see. And let's see, for this we've got about uh, 34 millimeters. So I'm gonna add that to my data table as the final at 30 minutes after I set it up. And I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna continue doing this for the other three. So we've got about two millimeters for the sawdust. And I'm gonna keep going and check each one of the four or however many um, feedstocks I decided to test. So we've got our results. We can think about other ways we might want to observe or notice differences between these four. Um, maybe you want to um, smell to see if you can tell anything that's going on or, or make other observations that way. If we were in the lab at UW-Madison where we welcome students, we could use something like an ethanol probe to stick in there and see how much ethanol was um, fermented from the feedstock, or if you happen to have a breathalyzer, you could use that too. So once we've got our results, we sort of have a puzzle. We know from our experiment that the sugar works the best, maybe the easiest, to ferment into ethanol. So why don't we just use sugar to make biofuels since we know it works the easiest? Well, we want to be really careful with how we think about making biofuels. We want to make a fuel that doesn't jeopardize land or effort or uh, resources that we need to use to make things, to grow things like corn and sugar cane that are going to be used to feed people, animals around the world. We don't want to have this conflict in between food and fuels. So that's why the researchers at Madison and other partners around the U.S. are working on trying to find ways to use what we call cellulosic biofuels. So there is sugar in our sawdust, in our trees, and in our grasses, but the structure of it isn't as digestible for the yeast. In the cane sugar here, we've just got glucose. The yeast is able to take that, to process it, to ferment it, and get our ethanol. In the cornmeal, our glucose is locked up in chains. Chains, uh, you might have heard it called starch. So in order for the starch to be broken down into the glucose, the yeast can ferment, we need maybe heat or enzymes to kind of cut that chain into bite-sized pieces. And it gets even more complicated with the cellulosic sugars. Our, our poplar trees, our sawdust, and our our grasses and our other prairie plants. So this experiment shows you the puzzle that our researchers are working on right now. We don't have it all figured out and there's still so much to learn about these different types of plants, how we might be able to break them down, and the yeast and how we might be able to work with yeast to help it make the products that we want to make, different types of fuel and other different things that we would make from oil but this time we'd rather make it from the plants instead. So I'd like to encourage you to try this experiment. Um, just look in your kitchen, look in your neighborhood to see what you can find to, to do. Um, you can replicate it a couple times if you want to verify your data. I hope you have fun, stay safe. Um, you can comment on this video to let us know what you learned, what you found, or ask us any questions about the research that's going on at Madison. We'd be happy to hear from you, and we hope to see you really soon. Stay well.